once every so often, there comes along a man who personifies humility, honesty, and statesmanship. Dick Elliott is just that man. As a husband, father, successful businessman, and admired leader, Dick Elliott has led a life that could only be described as a fairy tale. Born in the small rural town of Cassett, South Carolina, Dick learned early on that a good education and hard work was the key to success. One of his high school teachers uh, one day told me in the bank that um, Dick was so far ahead of everybody else in his class that um, he needed to be higher than he was. He was very, very bright, very, very bright in school. And she, then back then you, you didn't have these um, um, college courses offered and didn't have Seagull and all this stuff. But she remarked, she said, I feel so bad for him because um, he just knows more than I do sometimes. But he took it upon himself to read and study and get outside help. Um, by outside help, I mean reading and keeping up with um, current events and things like that. And I think that really helped him uh, later in life because he applied himself very much. And I think it was uh, because of the upbringing that our parents uh, instilled in us. While money was tight, Dick managed to scrimp and save and put himself through school, earning an engineering degree from Clemson University. Dick was now ready to set off after his dream. Well, Dick came home and uh, after going to Clemson, told my mother, he said, Mother, he said, I'm going to the beach and open up a real estate business. And he said, I need X amount of dollars. And my mother uh, and I and Dick were in the living, in the living room and she said, Dick, uh, are you sure? He said, Mother, I'll make this commitment to you. I'll be a millionaire at 40 or I'll be sleeping in the streets. And the rest is history. Well, he accomplished that goal, didn't he? So my dad uh, decided he wanted to come to the beach. There wasn't a lot going on in Cassett. He, uh, his friends made fun of him. They always said they were going to stay at home and work their family farms. and. And they called him Dicky at the time. Said Dicky's gonna go down to the beach and get some sand in his shoes, and he's gonna go broke and come back home. And I said, "How are you going to go to the beach, Dick?" And he said, "Well, necessary, I'll walk." And so uh, he started out. And you said, "Well, don't, look here, don't let him walk, for goodness' sake." I know he'll walk if he has to, knowing Dick. And you said, "At least let's take him to Macby and put him out." So we took him over to Macby and and put him out, and then he thumbs to the beach. He didn't have a wash rag with him, didn't have a shirt or anything, but knowing Dick, he made up his mind to go to the beach. And that's kind of how he got down to the beach. North Carolina, it was Clemson where I have, have a degree in engineering. And that's what, uh, what uh, brought me to the beach. I injured an ankle uh, right at the end of the senior year, or during the senior year. And I would get some of my buddies and we'd come to the beach. We probably had five dollars a piece in our pocket, and we stayed at a guest house with about ten people sharing one bathroom, one shower, and uh, that was our that was our recreation at the time. While I was staying here, I stayed with the same company for six or eight times, and one day he's eighty-three years old, a fellow named A. M. Royce. He'd been in business here since the 40s. And he said, Dick, he said, you love the beach, don't you? I said, yeah, I love it. Wish I could stay here. He said, you can. I'll sell you this business, and you can move right along with it. Well, I'd interviewed with uh, several firms, DuPont, Duke Power, and two or three others when I was a senior at Clemson to go to work with them as an engineer. But I came here, went in the real estate business and development business, and uh, five years later got in the golf course construction and operation building. And I built Beachwood Golf Course, which was one of the five original golf courses that started the commercial play along the Grand Strand. And that was in 1966. 
In 71, I came out here, bought this track of land at Eagle Nest and constructed this golf course, and we've been here since 1971. A union that seemed inevitable, one that would last for over 52 years, was about to begin. I did not meet Dick until after high school. He grew up in the, in the country, in a big city of Cassett, which consists of a railroad track and three stores and a Baptist church and a little tiny post office, um, which my cousin managed until just recently she retired. So we, we met on a Sunday afternoon and began dating. And I went to Limestone and he went to Wingate College. So I didn't see him very much for a long time. And we just kept running into each other and, and, um, and dating a little bit from time to time. So we met again and we got married. And, um, and so we've been married now for 52 years. Uh, we've raised three children. And before we were married, I remember a conversation with Dick and he said, you know, I would like to work until I'm 40 and hopefully at that time I can give back to, um, to society, to people, um, some form of service. We got married in uh, January of 1961. And uh, she's from Bishopville, South Carolina. And uh, I had dated her back in the 50s. She went to Limestone College. And uh, a year later, I went to Clemson College. My father got killed when I was 18, and I had to sort of take care of an invalid mother and two younger girls. And that was a chore when you had to make the money to pay the tuition at Clemson. And uh, so anyway, that was some of the tough years that we experienced. And there was never any money. We were broke as a church rat, I guess. And uh, we, we didn't have anything. We just had a willing spirit, a motivated uh, person, and uh, ready, to, ready to rumble. But uh, we didn't have any money. My mom is a person that helped you know, get us in school, make sure we had a good meal at night, and took care of us. So, uh, for as they always say, for every good man, there's a good woman. For every good woman, there's a good man. And my mom certainly exemplifies that. Rick is the oldest one that runs the real estate office here. David is number two. He's in uh, there's a Marietta, Georgia. He's uh, in the golf business there. He's buying a golf course and he operates it. And uh, Angela, the youngest one, she uh, has finished college, Columbia College, and then she went to USC Law School and she's now practicing law in Greenville. And uh, she's doing quite well with it. She's a single practitioner. But she told me last night, she said, I am busy, 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 and I'm going to have to bring in somebody to help me very shortly. So she's doing quite well. All my kids never had any problem with drinking, drugs, or those sorts of things. I think they were, if you can say, a model child. All three of mine were model children, and they were really never a problem to their mother and myself. Well, my brothers are older, and so um, I was sort of almost like an only child because my brothers are almost out of high school by the time I came along. And some of my fondest memories, my dad has this big, huge reclining chair that sits over beside the sliding glass door in our den. And um, he would always, he would sit me right beside him in that chair. And when I was little, I, and he was smaller as well, <laughs> I could actually fit right beside him and sit in the chair and we would sit up at night and we would watch TV or he would read the paper and I would try to read the paper with him or pretend to read the paper. Um, and, and I just remember those moments just sitting in my dad's lap. Safest place you could ever be. Do you know what a candy stripe is? Well, I've had them before. Because if you did something wrong at my house, if we back talk bomb, we had to go pick out the switch in the back of our legs. We'd have to go to gym class and people would be laughing at you because she had little cut marks from the switches. 
that, 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 and I guess whatever you did, guess what? You didn't do it again. So I, I was raised that way, and I think that's a generational thing, but you know, I think that should be done more sometimes. If you got a real bad kid and they're doing something they shouldn't be, you'll learn by doing that way. You know, I'm not a drinker, I'm not a smoker or anything, but I was raised not to do all those things, and I don't. And I think that's the result of my way I was brought up. My dad is a Clemson man. My mom's a Gamecock. My brother is a Gamecock. My sister's a Gamecock. I went to South Carolina, but I like Clemson. So we have a you know, normal family squabble about every late October. Or when is it, November? When is the football? Every late, we have a normal family squabble every uh, November when Carolina Clemson play. And after that, it's over. We move on and worry about bowl games and where we're going to go on a Christmas trip. On the travels, each we started when Rick and they were babies. And after Christmas, every year, we always take a trip. And when the boys were growing up, it was always the bowl games. And when Angela came along, she was like six weeks old. She was born in October, the last of October. We went to the Gator Bowl the Orange Bowl, and back to the Peach Bowl. So she went to three bowl games and she was six weeks old. So she was indoctrinated into football. And Rick and David stood when she was at the nursery and said, Rick says, she's going to be a Clemson fan. And David says, no, she's going to be a Carolina fan. So they argued because their house is divided. Because my uh, degree is from Coastal Carolina and USC. And Dix is from yeah, I went to Clemson. When I ran for the county council, my slogan was, Marvin Chernoff, help me with the, with the campaign. We put up billboards and all the things that you do now. But the senator, the congressman, nobody until we put up billboards had ever used billboards, had ever used the kind of massive mail out that we used. But uh, anyway, the slogan was, in a field by himself. And Dick beyond in the morning, I'd go by there at 5 or 6 o'clock. And Dick would say, where's Dick? He'd, he'd moo like a cow. He said, he's out there in the field by himself. Would somebody please go help him? <laughs> and so uh, anyway, all that cutting up on the phone with Dick beyond, I think, really helped me do so well in the race and the runoff for county council. I don't know of anyone who has given more public service than Dick Elliott. He served on North Myrtle Beach City Council. He was uh, with the county council for a number of years, then a house member, and then a state senator. And uh, I don't know how many years that would be. I suppose at least 50 years of public service. And, and he has helped a tremendous amount of people very quietly, and that's Dick's nature. While Dick has always known the value of hard work and discipline, he also knew the value of creating long-lasting and enduring friendships. Dick and Billy Witherspoon were, and I think Frankie Blanton were going fishing up in North Carolina. And I said, and they were just going for overnight, and I said, Dick, you better take some extra clothes. He says, oh, we're just going for overnight. I won't need anything. So he left. Well, it just so happens that he was getting ready to get out of the boat, and the boat started separating from the dock, and Dick went in the water. So when I got home, he had on a pair of blue jeans. I knew they weren't his, and I said, oh, when did y'all find time to go shopping? He says, we didn't. I fell in the water. So I'm laughing, and Billy Witherspoon is horrified because he said, I worried about him because he was freezing. I had the heat on full blast. I was burning up all the way home. And he says, all Ann did was laugh. I said, I laughed because I gave him warning of what might happen. And he was so sure that it wasn't going to happen to him, and yet it did. So that was, that was pretty funny. <laughs> We've played all over the world. We played golf in Ireland. I played with him in Canada, played with him in uh, Nova Scotia, uh, Bar Harbor, Maine, uh, all over Florida, even out in Scottsdale, Arizona, we played golf. One time we were out in Scottsdale 
playing these desert courses. And and Larry and Harry and myself at the turn after nine holes, we went up to the snack bar and uh, got us something to drink and a sandwich real quick. And Dick stayed down there in the cart. He had had a long night, and he just kind of laid down in the seat of golf seat of the golf cart, and we came back down, he was sound asleep, laying across that golf cart. And I woke him up, and I said, let's go, Pooh Man. He reared up, he said, you have awakened a golfing demon. I said, well, let's go, demon. So anyway, we get him over uh, behind the cart and get his pants all straightened up, his shorts all straightened up. And then we get to the next hole, and they're building a house on this next hole on the next tee. And normal debris in the yard, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But there's a porta john in the back of the, the house. And he tells us, I've, I've got to go. i got to go. I'll, I'll see you in a few minutes. Y'all just wait on me here, or just, I'll catch up with you. So he goes sort of crab walking across the lot. <laughs> it's kind of a fast crab walk, though. <laughs> it's about 200 yards from us to where the porta john is. And I asked Rayford, I said, what would happen if somebody's in that port john and the door's locked? Rayford said, oh, my God. <laughs> he, said, well, he said, I wouldn't want to be that door nor the man on the inside of that thing or the port johns because he will destroy it. As a political leader, Dick Elliott stood out in an era when partisan politics took hold of our nation. He built a reputation for hard work personal service and unwavering commitment to the ideals that made our country great. When this torch of freedom was passed through our generation by our forebearers, we have the responsibility to nourish it, enhance it, protect and preserve it, and then pass it along to our children and our grandchildren, stronger and burning brighter than when we received it. God bless America. God bless our veterans. Thank you all very much. The idea of principle over partisan politics was important to Dick Elliott. He believed in the notion of placing people over politics. Dick and I have had a, a unique situation that you don't find real common in the State House, and that is for a House and Senate member from the same area working together for as long as we have. We had been together for 16 years while he was in the Senate and I was in the House. Uh, you do see that occasionally, but in our situation, he's a Democrat, I'm a Republican, so throughout the 16 years you had Republican and Democratic administrations. So there were a lot of times where we were able to complement each other. If there were things that, that I might be able to do a little bit better than, uh, than he could, depending on the administration, then he readily recommended us going in that direction. Of course, there were other times where, where he may be able to, to take the lead and it would be better for me to be in the background. So we, we learned how to figure out to, uh, how to tackle things in that manner. And, um, and I think that was a, a good secret to how we were successful in getting a lot of things done. He was a people's representative. Um, he didn't play the Democratic card or the Republican card. He tried to do what's right and tried to move South Carolina forward. And he always put his constituents first. No, there wasn't any base out there that was going to push him one way or the other. He, he was kind of a middle of the road guy that tried to do things the right way. Dick Elliott would get the job done. It was about people, not politics with him. And he was one of these kind of people that really that if if he left a meeting or left a conversation and somebody asked me, is he a Democrat or Republican, uh, you almost have to say, I, I really don't know. Uh, he was a proud Democrat, no question about that, and I respect that about him. But uh, it, was, it was about people before politics when it came to Dick Elliott. He really did never play party politics, and he, he uh, just uh, went about his business trying to help people, and he was a conservative conservative business person and uh, people like that you know government needs some more conservative business people and uh, he represented that's what he represented I'm extremely conservative when it comes to spending my money and more conservative when it comes to spending the public tax dollars and so being in a Republican district and being ultra conservative probably more conservative than any of the Republicans. 
And people realized that, and they supported and voted for me. Somebody asked me one time about trying to get him to join the Republican Party. I said, really, Dick Elliott's too conservative to be a member of any organized political party. But uh, he cared about people. He cares about people, and he has never forgotten where he came from. Obviously, here in the Senate, um, the Republicans, when they took over, um, it was it was a kind of busy, busy time around here with them taking over. But uh, Senator Elliott um, always worked across party lines. Uh, he even in, with that transition, there was never any animosity from him, where there very easily could have been with the Republicans taking over. But he was always a true gentleman. Uh, always reached across the party lines and worked very well for his constituents in Myrtle Beach. We made a little bit of money, but not a whole lot off of Dick because he was always that, I'll use the word tight, you know, what I'm and conser well, conservative I like better. But anyway, that's the way we had to deal with Dick when it comes to, and it still do, in fact, you know what I mean? Because he always wants that special price, and we always try to look out for people, and we and we did because he had looked out for us, like the cutting the highway and stuff, and he's and he's done a lot of things, good good for the people, and, and I just like Dick. With Dick Elliott, you got what you saw, you know, uh, a great guy, um, a humble man, a proud man, um, a compassionate and sincere man, and and again, someone who has served his community and has served his state with great honor. And for those of us that had the joy and the honor to serve with him, um, it was just truly a great pleasure. Dick Elliott's record of service remains unparalleled in the history of South Carolina politics. I always believed in doing things and doing it right. I spent 30 years in coming to House and Senate, 10 in the House, 20 in the Senate. I never missed a single day being on the job working for 30 years, which is probably unheard of in this country anywhere. But uh, when it came to constituent service, uh, then I always returned calls myself. I had to grow sometimes to dial them, but I talked to them myself. I didn't pass them on to some staff member. It took a lot of time. And I was in that Columbia office every night that I was there until 11 p.m. And that's when the security system came on. So we had to get out, and Glenn McConnell from Charleston was the other senator, and we usually leave together about five minutes to 11, and we'd sometimes go get something to eat, sometimes we'd uh, just go on home. Senator Elliott used to get kicked out of the building before I started working for him. He would be up here after 11, and that's when the security guard does the final check of the building. And many nights he would get kicked out um, because he was the only one in the building working. And then um, when I first started working for him, he would beat me to work. He would get up early, early in the morning and come up and work. And um, I remember him being one of the hardest working men that I know. And wh all, all the while doing it with sincer sincerity and love and a genuineness for wanting to help people. He was notorious for staying late in the Gresset building, and our guys kind of had to edge him out of the building around 11 o'clock at night. But we never made him leave the State House. He was always uh, able to stay here in the Senate chamber, so um, I'd stay with him a couple times when he'd stay late uh, doing things for his constituents. He would, if we adjourned late, he would stay over and make phone calls and that sort of thing. So he was never run out of the Senate chamber. And there's no question, without Dick Elliott's leadership, uh, I don't think we would have had any of those major projects. I don't think we'd have had 22. I don't think we'd have had 31. He was instrumental beyond what people know in this community. People don't, don't have an idea of what Dick did, how many late hours and nights. I know personally, I've been on private aircraft with him as late as 12, 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning, jumping around the state trying to get support for critical dollars that was needed or critical issues that was needed to move the progress of 22 and 31 along. So uh, a lot of people's not aware of how much Dick has done in this community. He genuinely is one of the most committed people to just simply trying to do for others. I think he carries out the notion, frankly, the notion that the Bible speaks about when it talks about uh, doing unto the least of these. Um, Dick Elliott genuinely cares about helping other people. And I think he always viewed public service and serving in office not as what could it do for me, but 
What can I do for others? Please tell your children of today what it was like in this nation in the 40s and in the 1950s. Please tell them firsthand. They can get a better story from you than they ever could from the history books. Mm -hmm. Tell your children and your grandchildren how it was the police brutality, the billy sticks, the police dogs, the high pressure fire hoses. Tell your children today's generation. Tell them about the colored bathrooms at the depot, the bus station. Tell them about going to the back window to get a sandwich. Tell them the truth and tell them how it was in America only a few years ago. I will give my dad credit, great credit, because over the years he did a fantastic job of listening to people. Didn't matter who you were, he was always going to try to help. He, he operated from the um, position of how can I help you, what can we do, and government is in your way, what can we do to help government get out of the way so you can enjoy your life, do your business, work your farm, get, get Social Security, or whatever it was that you needed from the standpoint of government. And I think that probably there's him being somewhat of a private person about whom he's helped through the years. Uh, there, are, I keep hearing stories from other people that tell me now, and I don't think that any of us realize, even his family, some of the things that he's done. Where the man was saying that his house had, um, had caught, fire, caught up in a fire and it was right before Christmas and all the Christmas gifts for the kids had been destroyed. And um, our, I just remember my dad um, turning away so that the family in the car couldn't see after he finished talking to the guy and he gave him some money and he said, you know, make sure that your family has a good Christmas. And I just remember thinking, wow, that's really cool. And it just made such a huge impact to me to know. And he never said anything about it to me. He never said anything about it to my mom or anybody else. It was just um, quietly humble and a sincere gesture of kindness to someone else. As a young man, Dick Elliott understood that a good education was the key to his own success and he spent much of his life making sure tomorrow's leaders would have the same opportunities he had as well. Governor Hodges is best known for creating a lottery in South Carolina that today is educating a lot of people. That was his uh, really primary goal. He ran the election on establishing a lottery. After he was elected, he cultivated the House and Senate, and we passed the lottery bill because they were going for education. That was my heart string of all the issues is making sure that our children had a better opportunity than we had. Well, Dick was one of our real leaders on the lottery initiative. And I think a lot of this has to do with his uh, passion for education. Uh, he talked a lot about the value of education and, and what it meant to him and uh, what it meant to his family uh, and how important he thought it was to the future of South Carolina. Uh, he was a real leader in trying to put the votes together in the Senate that we needed to get the lottery initiative uh, not only on the ballot, but to flesh out the terms of the lottery once it passed. And I might add that uh, during the lottery campaign, he was instrumental in helping us get votes, you know, convincing people to support it and vote for it. Uh, and Ori was certainly very supportive of, uh, of our initiative to move that forward. But I think a lot of this spoke to, to Dick's feeling that you know, he had been successful in life and he had been phenomenally successful in business. And he wanted the kids who were coming along now and in the future to be able to have some of the advantages that he'd been able to take advantage of and to have the kind of business career he had. Uh, that, that speaks volumes about the kind of person he is. He uh, very focused on, on others and uh, opportunity for other people, uh, visionary in, in his support of education, not only uh, traditional uh, K through 12, but, but college education, and, and quite interested in making sure that 
education was accessible and affordable, whether it was in Horry County or, or any other corner of the state. My belief, strong belief, that we must have the best education possible for our children. That has been, I hope, the benchmark of my political career, yeah. to making sure that we did not shortchange our children. I had made a sale in late August, and the commission was like $1,600, which at the time was a lot of money. <clears throat> and I had co-brokered the sale with Senator Elliott's office, but I had tuition to pay, so I used some of his money to pay my tuition, hoping my mother would cover it. <clears throat> she told me no, I, that I need to deal with it with the senator. So I went over to the senator and told him that uh, if I could pay him next summer, his commission, he said, Hank, that'll be fine. You pay me next summer when you come back to work. So I, I came back and uh, worked the next year and I paid him the $800 I owed him. And that really meant a lot to me at the time because uh, as a young man trying to work his way through the school, every, every dollar helped. And I believe that, that Dick Elliott, before he leaves, will ha have a foundation that the kids from O'Ree County will have a place to go to get support for their college education, and it'll be the, the middle class, the ones that read, need the help, and I think they will be Elliott Scholars. I think from that Dick Elliott will have so many people coming out of that school with his name based on his Elliott Scholars, and I do believe that he will be his legacy is strong now, but it will be even stronger. Well, Dick, like I said, we, we, we've always been close. And uh, after I retired from education, I was appointed to the State Board of Education. And um, the day that I was sworn in, um, I looked up and Dick was there for me to be sworn in. And um, it was a very special moment. I later became chairman of the state board, and uh, he always said, sis, what's going on? It's kind of ironic sitting here in the office. We can't see it from here, but uh, the Dillon Middle School, uh, Senator Elliott played a big part in that, help, helping us pass a, uh, get a, a referendum on the ballot for a, a sales tax to generate funds to build a new middle school, and uh, we're happy that we have that now. And not only in Dillon, we were able to do some building in Lakeview and in Latta, and we appreciate uh, what he's done here. One of the things I'm most proud of is my family. As I mentioned, the boys were never a problem. The wife has been a good wife, and she's cooked for me. She's babies, babied for me, and, and anything that I needed, she was there to help and get it for me. But uh, the family life to me is very important and mine has been outstanding. I think the general public probably doesn't realize the amount of time that he did spend serving them in every way that he could. Um, and when I go to Columbia and I meet people, they always say to me many times, there are a few statesmen left and your husband is one of them and when he give you, gives you his word, it is his word, and you can count on it. And I think that will end up being his greatest legacy, is, is his honesty and his integrity, and that he truly cared about the people he served. My wife is an excellent politician. Uh, she was very helpful to me. She could go down the street, and uh, chances are, if the entire street was against me, when she got to the other end, at least half of them would be for me. Before Dick and I were married, I was working at the highway department, which was right across the street from the Capitol at the time. And I guess Dick, being a Democrat at the time, well, I was, it was going to be my first election to be able to vote. And I said, well, I, I saw Nixon and I shook his hands and I'm going to vote for him because he's going to be the president. And I think he thought I should have voted on the other side. But you know what? I've always been pretty independent, so I voted for President Nixon. <laughs> and that was my first vote, and I was so proud to cast that vote. Yeah. So I remember when Clinton came to, uh, to the Capitol and whether you liked his politics or not, you couldn't deny that he was pretty good looking. And so I met him and shook his hand and, and that, was, that was a really nice day. So 
So I guess I've been on both sides of politics. <laughs> I, I did a lot of campaigning through the years to help him. So I've come home from college to help with campaigns. I've, I've left Atlanta now that I have a family to come help with campaigns. So I, I, I did a lot of that. And uh, you know, one thing about my dad in politics, he did it for the right reasons. And I can tell you that. He did it because he wanted to help. He wasn't in it for the money because there's not money. He did it for, uh, I, I spent a day with my dad when, and phone rang all the time. Somebody had a problem. My dad always had time to listen and tried to help in every way. So I'm proud of the 30 years he served because I know, I don't know about all of them, but my dad did it for the right reasons because he cared about people and wanted, wanted to make a difference, not only for his state, for his, for his county and his district. Uh, my son uh, always told me, he said, Dad, if you hadn't gotten politics, he said, you could own this beach. I said, well, that's not a part of the plan. That was not part of the program. I wanted to do something to help somebody else because I had gotten uh, pretty successful in a short period of time here. And uh, so the tourism business was good to me. And uh, as far as the political process, it's cost me a lot of money. It cost anybody, if they do the job, a lot of money to serve, particularly when you're out of town serving. It does not take as much time or energy or cost to serve in city or county government. When you go to Columbia, and where I live, I'm three hours one way driving to Columbia, and uh, sometimes I come back during the week to make a speech at a civic club or something. And that bears on your heart, bears on your nerves, and it bears on a lot of your time, just driving six hours a week at least. And uh, of course, the time we spend in Columbia, we can't spend working our business. And uh, so it, it, it is a costly proposition. Well, you know, I'm really obviously very proud of my dad. And uh, I worked for a long time to please him, as I said earlier. And I, I gave it all. I gave it all, and he never really gave me a lot of emotion back. And uh, I just kept trying and trying and trying to please him. And, uh, of course, my mom, too. But now, as it's, now here we are today. He's 79, and I'm 51 years old. And the role has reversed, and it's uh, it's it's great to see him be proud of me and the things that I've done, and actually say it. And of course, the feeling is mutual with myself. So, you know, things change and roles reverse, but people and their values stay the same. And my dad has has represented. Uh, trust, integrity, and he has always tried to live his life doing the right thing, and I respect him for that. I got, in, got into politics in the late 90s and met Senator Elliott and, and learned a lot from him through his legacy and a lot, you know, just by sitting down talking to him. I think that, uh, that Dick's ability to relate to people at all levels uh, I, I've often said that y you see people in the legislature who are very good legislators, but bad business people or bad family people. Uh, and you see some who are not much of a success in the legislature, but who are really good in business. Uh, Dick was good at all those things. Uh, he was uh, committed to his family. He was a very good business person, and he was a very effective legislator. And the fact that on all levels he related, whether it was to a business person or to someone who was preoccupied with, uh, as they should, the education of their children, uh, or whether it was working with influential legislators in shaping legislation, he had the capacity to, to do all of those things. And uh, people respected that in, in the legislature, and I think his constituents did. Uh, I always thought it was remarkable that that he went from having a primary, primarily Horry County district in, when he was in the House and then early in the Senate to having a, a district that was as diverse as Horry County and Dillon County. Uh, and he had to deal with all sorts of people, all types of issues, 
uh, different periods from strong Democrat to strong Republican. Uh, and he uh, seamlessly handled that transition. Uh, I think a lot of that has to do with how hardworking he was, uh, with uh, the fact that he had such a unique background, and that, uh, that he was someone who truly had uh, multiple skills that he put to work in his service in office. I still like to think I'm part of the younger group of state senators because there's so many that have served for 25, 30 plus years. But I think he really is a role model and really represents, as, again, what I would say, the statesman that um, many of us want to emulate, and many of us, the, the, the person that many of us want to be and why we chose to serve. And um, for that, I will always admire and respect him greatly. My dad received the Order of the Palmetto from Governor Haley, and one of the things that was most memorable to that to me is Jim Melton came to him. Jim uh, has worked in the Senate for over 30 years, and he said to me that day, he said, wow, I've never seen a sitting governor come in when the Senate was in session like that. And that is a great tribute to your dad. Uh, our, our governor was uh, Nikki Haley and she's a Republican. My dad has been a lifelong Democrat. Members of the Senate and guests will please stand as we receive the governor of the state of South Carolina. And so for her to come in and do that meant a lot. It was a very emotional moment uh, for our family and it was a great opportunity for you know us to be there with him for that special day. It is a real pleasure to be on the Senate floor. I thank you, and it is for a very special occasion. We have a senator who has given so much of his time, 30 years of his life, 30 years of his family sacrifice, and 30 years of leadership as he's carried on in this house as well as the one across the hall. I will tell you that regardless of policies that come up in these chambers, we may agree or disagree, but none of us can disagree about the work that goes into serving the people of our district. Senator Elliott has served honorably, he served respectfully, he served with grace in a way that all of his people in his district and in South Carolina can be proud. Senator, you have made your state proud, you have made your family proud, you have made this chamber proud, and it is with great humility and great respect that I give you the state's highest civilian honor says in grateful recognition of your contributions and friendship to the state of South Carolina and her people, I do hereby confer upon you, Dick Elliott, the Order of the Palmetto. Thank you. And as he looks back over his career, over this uh, some 40 years or so in public life, I think Dick can, can count on a whole host of accomplishments that uh, have made uh, Myrtle Beach the tourism mecca that it is now, but have also made it a hell of a great place to live. Uh, and Dick's a large part of that. A great family, the boys are great, and the daughter, gosh, had she wanted to be, she could be Miss America, but have been Miss America. She is that type of lady. And, his, he's trained them that way. He's worked with them. They know, they know that that people come first. They're always that way. And there's nothing I can say better than he's been a dear friend. And you don't find many, and I love him to death. Even though he's not serving in the Senate now, we still consider him our public servant and representative because we know we can call Dick and get help for information or the right place to go for whatever. So thank you, Dick Elliott, for all your years of service, and we love you. He will always be Senator Elliott. It is a real honor and pleasure to have served with such a distinguished body and such a wonderful group of people in the state senate. You're all my friends from the left to the very right. And I love you very much. And I thank you all for the service that you've rendered to your state and for the opportunity to have the opportunity to serve with you. God bless you all. I leave you and with a, an affectionate farewell in my service to the Senate. Thank you. Dick Elliott has always met the challenges life had in store. 
For over three decades, whether as a businessman, councilman, state representative, or state senator, Dick Elliott has served the people of South Carolina with honor and dignity. He has left an indelible mark on our state. Few have reached the level of personal and professional success that Dick Elliott has achieved during his lifetime. As you look back on Senator Dick Elliott's life, you'll see a young boy eager to learn. You'll see a young man eager to work hard and take chances. You'll see a dedicated husband and father. And you'll see a public servant driven to making South Carolina a better place. Dick Elliott is truly South Carolina's statesman. Thank you.